So um, welcome back. Uh, we're going to start with things that are small, and then we're going to move our way up. Our, our next session is going to look at the nanotechnology, particularly ways in which biological designs show promise in the creation of nanoelectronics. We're joined here by Dr. Matthew Terrell, founding director of the Institute for Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. Matthew is a pioneer in the fields of bi biomolecular engineering, nanotechnology, and his work explores new materials based on self-assembly of synthetic and bio-inspired materials. Uh, let's join Matthew, to, uh, welcome Matthew to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, that that uh, summarizes accurately what I'm going to try to talk about, that is molecular engineering inspired by biology. IBM's been doing molecular engineering with various kinds of materials and with various kinds of ends for a long time. What we're doing at the University of Chicago that's new is that we're creating a new engineering program focused specifically on engineering at the molecular level. And I'm going to talk about uh, examples uh, from that. Basically, what we mean by molecular engineering is incorporating synthetic molecular building blocks, be they electronic, photonic, mechanical, biological, to create functional systems. And we're not entirely focused on biology at Chicago, although that will be what I talk about today. But we're talking about new technologies from uh, synthetic biology, which I will talk about, to quantum information science, which I won't. <clears throat> we're really trying to think about uh, transcending interdisciplinarity. That is, we're not going to have departments, we're not going to be focused o internally on disciplines, but rather on goal-oriented engineering research to bring solutions to society based on the control of structure of matter at uh, the nanoscale and at the molecular scale. And of course, biology does play a big inspirational role in this because we know it happens in natural systems. So we want to learn how to do this, train people to do it, and create a team of people at Chicago uh, that can interface with molecular level science to address major societal problems. In doing this, I, I find myself, uh, even though I'm an, an engineer, educated as an engineer, but has worked very closely with scientists, somehow explaining the difference between science and engineering. You know, science is about discovery, engineering is really about design and invention, and uh, that's an idea that we want to keep reinforcing. Uh, obviously, they're complementary and both very creative activities, but the idea of what we're doing is to exploit molecular level science to develop solutions to big societal problems, and my sort of catchphrase is that engineering is that path from science to society. So we're going to be hiring um, a team of at least 25 faculty members over the next five years or so in a wide range of enabling areas that will enable us to do molecular engineering. And obviously, the matchup with the things we're talking about here today is very good. That's enough advertising for my new job. Um, what I really uh, am going to spend the remaining 40 minutes or so on, or a little less, are things that I think are important in this realm for the subject of today. And I'm going to focus on four different areas. And, and they're there. You can, you've probably already read them. I'll come back to them one by one and start in on synthetic biology. What we're really talking about is the modern age of genetic or metabolic engineering where we can imagine living foundries. That is, synthetic biology for synthetic chemistry, making a wide range of products that are perhaps known in nature but aren't necessarily made by the organisms uh, that we would like to make them in the most efficient way. And this can certainly and is influencing pharmaceuticals, fuels, commodity chemicals, precursors to plastics, and, and other polymers. We're really talking about re-engineering organisms to produce non-native products and perform non-native functions. And I think these two things, I'll, I'll try to bring it out, but the, have somewhat different constraints and requirements on them. Essentially, one can think about synthetic biology to make things, which is what I've emphasized so far, or synthetic biology to do things, creating organisms that uh, are important in healthcare and therapies as well. But what we really need to push this field farther is the development of a set of engineering principles for design, construction, characterization of biological systems so that this can go faster in a more verifiable and predictable way, and therefore to advance a, a wide range of uh, biotechnologies and biomedical therapies. 
there have been some significant successes that really inspire and uh, make this uh, believable as a much more concrete reality over the next five to ten years, and I'll draw on my recent past experience at Berkeley. One of my colleagues, uh, Jay Kiesling, figured out how to make the anti-malarial drug artemisinin, which uh, heretofore has been isolated from plants at $2.50 a dose in a bacterium, E. coli, for 25 cents a dose. Um, what he did was figure out how to install the right genes into the new organism. And it's a matter of uh, working this out over a dozen or so genes. And it's somewhat akin, in the figuring of this out, if you just did it in a haphazard way, uh, you know, if you wanted to plumb your house, throwing all the pipes in the basement and hope they self-assemble into the right plumbing for your house. That doesn't happen in a, in a very reliable way. Um, uh, what it actually took to accomplish this uh, with uh, Jay in the lead was a $40 million investment and five years of really serious work uh, funded by the Gates Foundation. What we're really talking about here, sorry, uh, is can this be repeated and systematized and done more routinely and try to turn the biotechnology industry into something like the computer industry. And this is a trivialization of the computer industry. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm giving away my punchline. Uh, <laughs> you know, when, when computer manufacturers make new computers, they gather off the shelf parts and assemble functional systems generally. A, you know, high tech um, industrial commercial version of, of Radio Shack, but there is no BioShack to get the components that one needs to put in here. But that is how people are talking about synthetic biology right now. They talk about genes as parts. Can we have standardized parts that can be plugged into new organisms in a robust way and perform in a uh, verifiable, reliable manner in a new biological context? And that's a, a very uh, tricky thing to accomplish. Uh, Adam and Ar Arkin and I at Berkeley in the spring chaired a DARPA workshop on synthetic biology where one of the ways we tried to characterize what needs to be done is to move from the early days of bioengineering where people were using enzymes to catalyze certain reactions and move in two different directions. That is, move from naturally useful enzymes into new mutated enzymes that are either designed or created in an evolutionary way and move from cells that have programs into uh, cells that uh, have new programs installed in them. And there's a kind of a barrier here that we haven't gotten beyond to really realize not only uh, fully functional cells for the wide range of applications, but even the networks of the uh, parts and tools that one would like to have as subsystems. So that's, where, that's what we're talking about and what we would like to accomplish in the field of synthetic biology. There is very early on uh, uh, in this field the appearance of uh, simulation programs that mimic <clears throat> the programs that were developed for integrated circuit design. You know, can we predict some of these things by computer-aided design? It's called BioSpice. Adam played a very early role. But even these things are in their very early stages. There's a big question in, in front of the field about how this is going to happen. And uh, is it going to happen by designing entirely new genomes that we can install reliably into organisms? Or is it going to happen by essentially gaining control of evolution? And there are different proponents and different practitioners of each kind of methodology. Chris Voigt uh, may be one of the most uh, exciting practitioners of the genome design idea, recognizing that many different bacteria have tools that do certain things reliably. And if you wanted a combination of these things, is there a way of um, essentially putting together these things, as I said before, in a standardized part kind of toolkit that they could be stall installed in an arbitrary genome and function. The other way is directed evolution. Uh, Francis Arnold at Caltech 
and uh, Pim Stemmer, who's uh, now in a startup company, shared the Draper Prize from the National Academy of Engineering recently for the development of directed evolution, which is a incremental approach to this, but essentially uh, what the uh, Amunix uh, has done for as an example of what can be done is to create um, longer circulating proteins, which people have known by synthetic chemistry could be done by attaching a, hydro, uh, sorry, a hydrophilic polymer uh, to direct evolution of the creation of a large hydrophilic polyamino acid in addition to the polymer, and they've achieved great success in extending the circulation time of proteins that could be that would otherwise be naturally eliminated by four generations of this directed evolution, which is introducing mutations, shuffling, uh, screening, and then picking the best candidates and repeating this uh, cycle of evolution. So this is a method that's making real progress. It is incremental and slower. So this sort of, uh, I, I think, tension or uh, um, competition of methodologies uh, is going to be uh, an important, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of years in synthetic biology. The next thing I want to talk about are a variety of efforts for various ends in recapitulating and regenerating biology. And in fact, um, you know, there, there have been some high profile statements of creating artificial cells. Um, that has to do with installing uh, a genome from one cell into another cell. Uh, what I'm really talking about here is recapitulating, reconstituting the machinery, the more local scale machinery of biology. What can we do, for example, to uh, mimic the mechanical processes of cell division? of synapses and functional interactions between cells, of compartmentalization inside of cells, of bacterial motility, which doesn't necessarily uh, occur inside of cells, but uh, we want to put this all on, I want to put this all in one picture, or the distortion of cell membranes, which is fundamental to cell movement. There are individual examples, if you've looked at the things in blue here, of where each one of these things or elements of each one of these things has been reconstituted in certain kinds of synthetic systems, but we're a long way from actually being able to put together functional machinery like this. Uh, for example, people have made uh, microspheres that um, have protein filaments on their surface that grow and propel uh, the uh, nanosphere motion something like bacterial motility, this little comet here that you see. People have reconstituted, Mike Dustin at NYU, Jay Groves at Berkeley, uh, immunological synapses and the structure of these things, which have a, a very interesting geometry. People have produced actin filaments on the surface of vesicles, which have no, none of the other cell ma machinery that enable us to uh, distort the shape. But this is, again, a long way uh, from actually being able to reconstitute a cell. My own uh, personal interests are in a smaller kind of machinery. What can we do on the synthetic level to mimic, the, to cre recreate and mimic the structure of proteins? And uh, we have many reasons for wanting to do this. Uh, what, what, what we've created are uh, a class of micellar particles where we uh, chemically conjugate peptide uh, head groups to lipid tails. So we get a micelle here, much like the detergent uh, emulsions in washing machines or dish, dish uh, detergent uh, things. But we know how to make mixed micelles, so we can put multiple copies of multiple peptides here and have shown some success in mimicking antimicrobial activity, which John Kelly mentioned before, DNA binding activity, some kinds of catalytic activity, uh, immune stimulation activity. And all of this is based, again, on a different kind of information technology, which is molecular recognition built into these things. I'm particularly interested in exploiting this analogy for therapeutic uh, applications, where one can exploit, again, the high valency and high multifunctionality. The analogy between these micelles and proteins may or may not be very deep, but proteins fold by putting their hydrophobic 
uh, residues in the middle and their biologically active stuff on the outside. And if these are spherical micelles, uh, they have about the same size as globular proteins, spheres in the nanometer range. There are, of course, uh, differences. As I said, we can create high multivalency and multifunctionality. So uh, just to presage what I'm going to say in a minute or two, we can have targeting peptides, diagnostic peptides, therapeutic peptides, and so on. But these also have a hydrophobic reservoir in the middle that can hi carry hydrophobic species and can disassemble at the target for cell penetration, which is useful in some of these applications. The application, just to make this concrete, that uh, we're beginning to have some success with is the idea of vulnerable plaque. And, and generally speaking, why would you want to create something like this and inject it into a, a living species? Uh, I highlighted the idea of targeting uh, asymptomatic pathologies, that is, things that aren't reporting on their, their presence on their own, that we could create a signal. Um, Vulnerable plaque refers to plaque, which is a buildup of lipids in the blood vessel wall that is mechanically unstable. And so unlike, let's say, stable plaque, which grows and leads to chest pain and other symptoms, what happens with these mechanically unstable plaques is that they sometimes rupture uh, early on and produce massive clotting events and very difficult consequences. The interesting thing is that these plaques all have uh, microscopic blood clots over their surface. And what we have created is a peptide lipid conjugate. Uh, so this is a naturally occurring phospholipid. This is a peptide that we've synthesized in the lab with a fluorescent label. And the two are conjugated through a polymer tail. But this peptide has high affinity for blood clots. And of course, a micelle has 80 to 100 copies of these molecules, so there's a high degree of multivalency that, that increase the avidity, uh, multiplying the individual molecular affinity. We put this polymer spacer in here because that helps make the peptide more accessible and helps swell the corona of this to drive it into a spherical particle. And then we do testing like this. You need an animal model. Uh, there's well-known animal models for atherosclerosis, uh, which are a genetic knockout that uh, essentially eliminates the HDL production, the high-density lipoprotein. So when they're fed the same diet over a couple of weeks, the wild, this is the lumen of a blood vessel near the heart of a wild-type mouse or the knockout mouse. You see that normal mice uh, don't uh, have any, uh, any of this pathology, but this uh, knockout mouse has... Um, blood vessels from the cell wall covering large atherosclerotic plaques. The experiment is to take a, a suspension of our micelles, inject them into the tail vein of the mouse so we're not doing any kind of local injection. These things have to move through the circulation, evade the liver and the spleen, and other kinds of elimination processes. And what we find is that we get a very strong targeting of these fluorescently labeled uh, micelles to the blood vessels in question. We've done control experiments. Uh, so we know that this is due to this peptide, and we've looked at other organs. Uh, some of it does end up in the liver, not much in the spleen, not much elsewhere. So we have prima facie, a good candidate here. We are now looking at attaching uh, things that are diagnostic. Here, we obviously sacrificed the animal and just looked at the blood vessels directly, but we can put in metal chelating peptides that would report back through MRI or PET scanning. And we can put in, if we knew what to put in, uh, therapeutic agents that might actually address this plaque, either uh, things that reduce inflammation or things that uh, might carry away the, the lipoprotein. So this is an example of uh, designing an entity inspired by biology that uh, perform some functions that actually no natural protein can actually do uh, that functions in the physiological environment. One last thing, these things, uh, our micelles actually accumulate extensively in the corners where the uh, sheath on the plaque rejoins the blood vessel wall. That's where the inflammation is, that's where the blood clots are. So we might actually learn something about the pathogenesis of this disease by a homing device that goes specifically to where the, the disease is generated. There's another aspect to regenerating and recapitulating biology that's important in regenerative medicine. 
And uh, this involves uh, essentially creating environments in which tissue can repair itself to repair or replace tissue that's lost by either damage or disease or age or, or something else. And uh, my colleague Sam Stoop, for example, has actually used these same kind of molecules that I just described, peptides attached to hydrophobic things, in this case, to create fibrous matrices that form gels that greatly stimulate the um, uh, environment for proper cell growth and differentiation. The nice thing about these kind of self-assembly uh, systems for doing this is that they're injectable. One can inject a water-like solution of these things that can self-assemble in situ to form these matrices. Uh, there's actually, I should have put a slide in this, I didn't think of it until I was reviewing this talk in my mind, yet another area where this kind of recapitulating biology I think is going to have really important uh, scientific and clinical impact. And that's for what people are, are coming to call organ on a chip or body on a chip, where one can recreate reasonably realistic models of tissue in a device where drugs can be tested or other kinds of uh, therapies can be applied without doing animal work. And uh, one can then think about you know, high throughput and possibly much more aggressive treatments uh, that don't get into the complications of uh, animal or clinical research. Uh, stem cell research is also very important. This idea of creating the right environments for uh, essentially reactivating the developmental biology program. And stem cell biology is all about the niches in which stem cells uh, find themselves as they differentiate into adult stem cells. And there's some really interesting things that suggest that uh, the progression of these things can be, in some cases, more strongly influenced by the environment than by the stem cells themselves. My former colleague, uh, Irina Conboy at Berkeley, did some very interesting experiments where she took stem cells from uh, young rats and implanted them in old rats, and took stem cells from old rats and implanted them into young rats. And essentially, the stem cells worked fine in the young rats, whether they were young rat stem cells or old rat stem cells, and didn't work fine in the older rats, whether they were young stem cells or old stem cells. Really kind of proving the point that uh, the niche and the environment, the material science environment that one creates for uh, regenerating these things is extremely important. Okay. Um, two other small things, and, and then I'll close and be happy to answer some questions that I wanted to point out. The next one is um, some interesting work uh, about uh, understanding noise in biology. Um, the, the person whose work I have been uh, thinking about and, and talking uh, with him about uh, is Mike Simpson at Oak Ridge. Um, the idea here is that always in biology, we're dealing with small populations. And so even if one can write down deterministic differential equations for a birth-death process, that is, these things are born and decay, uh, so one can solve the time uh, evolution of, uh, the, uh, of these P molecules, um, when you take data, if you take data with sufficient uh, care, uh, one sees fluctuations. So equation, uh, fluctuations about these kind of average trajectories from these differential equations. And at best, these uh, trajectories are, represent some kind of average trajectory over many things. This is a characteristic of systems that have low numbers of elements in them. And noise in biology comes from a lot of sources. There are certainly intrinsic sources that come from the central dogma here, DNA makes RNA makes protein, but then there are all these other factors that have to do with uh, transcription and protein production and cell division and so on that also have noise. So it's, it's not at all surprising uh, what, what I'm saying here, that, that one sees these kind of uh, fluctuations and, and stochastic variations in evolution. But what, what Mike and others have been pointing out is uh, 
that there seems to be a relationship between the deterministic response, that is, one does something to a cell, stresses it, or puts in a new factor uh, to provoke a, a long-term deterministic response, that, that that deterministic response is correlated with the noise. And um, you might think, at least uh, my, my first reaction to hearing that that might happen, is that as the uh, noise uh, goes down, uh, the deterministic response goes up, but just the opposite uh, seems to be true. Um, read this as deterministic response, plasticity uh, uh, being the, the, the kind of change that we're looking for in response to uh, some uh, factor that's uh, promoting that response, and this being the, the noise in the system. This is for the expression of some kind, uh, for, for a particular class of transcription factors. So what we're looking at is how a, a protein that changes DNA transcription is expressed seems to go up with increasing noise. That is, noise somehow amplifies the deterministic response rather than uh, bringing it down. And Mike has uh, half a dozen examples like this. I, I haven't checked to see myself how broad this is, um, but uh, he has. And uh, you know, this is at least um, uh, sufficiently represented to, representative to be paid attention to. And the reason I bring it up is not that I, I even uh, want to make this such a profound biological fact, although I really do think it's interesting. Um, they think it's related to the fact of, you know, we're talking about systems comprising small number of elements and a kind of tightness of packing of these things so that there's serious competition for resources and space here. But the, the more interesting point, I think, is if we're talking about nanoscale engineering and learning from biology, we're going to be making synthetic systems that do not necessarily have fully deterministic responses. And there might be some aspects of this if systems are created with small numbers of elements and the same kind of uh, competition for space and resources. These guys have also uh, suggested that looking at noise response might tell us something about the system. That is, something about the time scale, let's say, of autocorrelations in the noise relative to the fundamental time scales of the process might tell us something about the process. Uh, thinking that I was going to be speaking in the same symposium with Steve Koonin, I uh, reminded me of this DOE report a few years ago of five challenges for science and the imagination, one of which is to master energy and information on the nanoscale to create new technologies with capabilities rivaling those of living systems. And I think the point that I want to make is it's not uh, going to be uh, the, the kind of design job that we're doing has to include these elements of fluctuations and uh, stochastic uh, processes that are occurring. Um, the last thing I want to point to, which I think is, is really relevant here, and I'm not going to have anything terribly profound to say about that, is efforts uh, that uh, are beginning to be mobilized for mapping the connections in the brain. Um, there uh, are reasons to think about doing this. This may be the sort of cart before the horse, but earlier this year, Battelle did a study uh, of what the economic impact of the Human Genome Project and uh, figured that you know, something like single digit uh, numbers of billions of dollars of investment to get this done has produced hundreds of billions of dollars in economic impact and jobs. Uh, of course, they, they looked at uh, uh, not only the direct benefits of this, but uh, the consequences for equipment manufacturers and other kinds of businesses uh, that develop from this and, and so on. So this was a very thorough uh, study. Um, uh, I, I have a bigger version of this. Uh, so, but they, uh, what I wanted you to see is that they, you know, they looked both at direct impacts and other things that happened because of this that they call uh, backward linkage effects and, uh, sorry, again, uh, made some, uh, I think, uh, impressive, if accurate, uh, uh, estimations 
of not only the economic impact that I already pointed out, but sort of the payback of this investment. Uh, that's motivational to think about um, is the, the time ripe and what would enable us to pursue a human connectome project, uh, of which there actually are things that are named this. NIH has uh, created a, a relatively uh, small scale program so far, uh, which is actually mainly a project to mount, map the mouse brain. These, these are sort of the, the steps that have been made over the last 25 years. 25 years ago, uh, the uh, connectome of a worm was fully mapped by Sidney Brenner and, and his team. Uh, I think that there's some evidence that the fruit fly uh, connectome, which has 150,000 neurons, is close to being understood. The mouse brain takes that up uh, another order of magnitude and uh, the human brain takes it up many farther orders of magnitude. So this would be a, an extremely ambitious project. Um, it's not only structure that we would be after, but function. So one has to, if one wants to pursue this, just as the Human Genome Project required major advances in sequencing technology and other technologies, one has to think of a whole range of uh, new kinds of devices that enable us to visualize and analyze images better than we can now. None of the techniques that are available now are, are up to this task, either in the measurement or the analysis side, and to think about the, the functional connection aspects of this. Uh, what really seems possible is uh, a really interesting opportunity for the convergence of nanoscience in the device and imaging area with neuroscience uh, to tackle this really big problem. These are the goals from the NIH uh, human uh, connectome project, a set of integrated non-invasive imaging tools, a, a way to uh, link whatever data is created to other data sets, and then the dissemination of this. But you know, this is something that's being done in the tens of millions of dollars, and it's clearly going to take a lot bigger investment to make significant progress in this area. Um, you know, my, my closing slides are actually really reflect very much what we've heard already, especially from the, the previous talk. Of course, um, information in biology, as in many other fields, comes from observations and measurements. And there's a huge number of things at all scales to measure, from the molecules uh, to the interactions between molecules to the networks uh, in which these things exist. But in this area, as we already heard, uh, information comes from measurement, but uh, measurement is more than detection. Um, getting the numbers won't be good enough. And these things that we've been talking about already this morning, about machine learning and ways of uh, creating meaning out of numbers, are very relevant. I'll let it go there and be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm Tim Lance from NISANET, which is the research network in New York. Um, a million biological questions like the stem cell work on the growing blood vessels recently indicates that the stem cells don't behave the way they expected it, even though they had this machine running. But this is a human question. You're building something where you're trying to create something within a university where people work across disciplines and collaboratively. What do you do about issues like promotion and tenure and the other reward system? And could you expand that out to the rest of the University of Chicago? Yeah, um, well, the um, engineering institute that we're creating is an independent unit. So we will be able to, to manage our own processes that way. We're not part of, say, a, another division or another large school. So even though you know, I'm the only faculty member there, I'm treated like a dean. And in some ways, I've been a dean. Uh, it's, this is like the ideal dean's job. You know, uh, no, <laughs> no faculty and no students. Uh, but uh, that won't last long if I do my job well. Um, the, so, you know, I, I think we're really, I think the University of Chicago has created initial conditions for this to uh, prosper without uh, that kind of problem. Uh, 
<coughs> this is in line with your, I, I guess, recap recapitulating biology and maybe a little bit of what John Kelly's talk about um, the human brain. I, and maybe not so much the blueprints, but at least the uh, instruction manual through a process called development actually does build a human brain. And, and, and so um, where, where is engineering science in this with regard to looking at the way the, the, the coding in the DNA is translating to these circuits and then the ultimate construction of the human brain itself? So could, could you comment on that? Well, I, I'm not sure I can comment really profoundly, but uh, what I was trying to bring out, and I'll sort of maybe reiterate in a way, is that um, the um, programming of uh, stem cells as they uh, uh, differentiate into different adult forms is really heavily influenced by the environment that they're in. Uh, in, in some, you know, important ways, they can be, their, their, their future can be entirely uh, determined um, by their environment. And by the way, this not only uh, applies to sort of forward programming, the, the kind of development, but, you know, also in the exciting area of uh, reprogramming, that is taking adult stem cells and reversing the developmental pathway uh, seems to, uh, rely predominantly on just a handful of factors that can drive these things back toward something uh, resembling embryonic stem cell behavior. So um, I, I think engineering in this area is about providing the right environments. If, if, if by engineering you're talking about uh, driving these things into useful forms for therapeutics or biotechnology, it's about providing the environments uh, that give the right signals to make the cells develop in the way you want. Yes, sir. Ralph Gomery from NYU. Uh, I was wondering, in the case of the worm, where you were able to get all the connections, could you then correlate the connections with the actions of the worm in any way? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly how far uh, that went. I, I think uh, that, and I, I should go back and check, um, that that was more, that that, that that speaks, your question speaks to the uh, architectural versus functional part of this, and this was largely an architectural study. So. Uh, I could be wrong, but I don't know what kind of information was extracted on behavior. Hi, I'm Jim Myers from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm just going to comment in sort of general area of questions. So a lot of the things you were talking about there uh, were very much on the experimental side, um, and so there's certainly a lot of computation going on. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to get your opinion of where do you see computation is really starting to take the lead versus experiment? Um, what, what things do you think are missing and, and how do you see the center you're putting together? What's the role of, of computational um, prediction in this? Well, I, I think um, synthetic, from the, the topics that I talked about from synthetic biology to sort of creating synthetic mimics of proteins, essentially all boiled down to understanding structure function relationships in proteins. So part of that is what people call the protein folding problem. But um, then, you know, going be a little bit beyond that, uh, I think protein protein interactions. So I think that the tools that enable us to understand better the, the shapes of proteins under various circumstances, and, and of course, with various manipulations of structure, and then how proteins interact with one another and with other molecules, of course, are probably the, for, for somebody who does mainly do experiments, the easiest to visualize important problems because th th there, are, there are no doubt many other important computational problems. I'm not trying to say that, but in the context of what I'm talking about, um, understanding protein structure is the fundamental thing. Uh, Chinidip Masuji, Yale University. Um, I wonder if you could uh, share with us a few words about what you think are the ways that biology is inspiring uh, computing 
engineers will proudly say that they've never seen a supersonic bird, and at the same time, man-made flight was clearly inspired by uh, looking at birds flying, and uh, we developed aerodynamics and hydrodynamics and engines and whatnot, and we, we got flight. Um, so maybe just your opinion on the ways in which biology might influence or inspire computing, while at the same time uh, being cognizant of the fact that computing will never exactly mimic uh, biology. Well, I, 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 to be really honest, I'm not sure I'm very well qualified to talk about how biology is going to influence computing. What, what I was originally asked to talk about and it was mentioned was somehow how biology might influence um, electronics and uh, you know maybe the hardware. Uh, underlying computing, and you, you know, I think um, there's maybe two things that have to be thought about uh, in much more detail uh, to use biological methods to build important new structures for this industry. First of all, many of us like to talk about self-assembly, uh, and in some sense, biology uses self-assembly. That is, molecules have kind of built-in programs to their architecture that drive them to organize in certain ways. Um, but I don't think uh, we're going to get uh, the mileage out of self-assembly for, for fabricating real things until we stop taking pictures of self-assembled structures and really start to try to make things in real time with self-assembled structures. So. Um, you know, biology, for example, doesn't really just allow proteins to fold all by themselves. Um, there's other proteins that uh, catalyze or template that, or chaperone, as, as some of these proteins are called. So, you know, I think that if we want to uh, use some of these biological processes, we can't be satisfied with the rates. You know, it's nice that self-assembly is spontaneous in a thermodynamic sense, but spontaneous doesn't mean instantaneous. Uh, we, we want to be able to learn how to drive the rates of self-assembly processes uh, to make uh, new things out of them. I, I think really what uh, is needed is to not, uh, again, uh, if, we, if we want to uh, make important new structures, is not to focus so much on isn't this a pretty structure that we can make with self-assembling molecules but to really think about the processes that are going to get us there, because I don't think the promise of biological, biologically inspired material science or assembly is going to be realized um, just by letting things happen by self-assembly. We're going to have to learn how to direct it, catalyze it, apply fields to it, uh, constrain it or template it in some way. So I, I'm, I'm ducking your question about computing because I don't really know that much about computing, so. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So. <laughs> thank you. Okay.